Hello and welcome to the Talking Roadmaps channel. My name is Justin Woods and I'm one of the co-hosts here where we talk about everything to do with roadmaps from the good, the bad, the ugly. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce you to you, Matt LeMay. Matt, welcome. Thanks so much, Justin. Happy to be here. As you know, we're going to be talking about roadmaps. It's the, the channel is called Talking Roadmaps, but it's really to talk about people's experiences. Now, having been a former product manager myself, there have been times when roadmaps have been particularly unhelpful for me, and there have been times when they've been a great tool as well. So I'm really interested in, in understanding your experience with them. And of course, Matt, you're an agile expert as well. I'm an agile expert who is sick to death of thinking about agile. So uh, if you if you sense some exasperation in my voice when discussing agile, it is because agile is something some people made up 21 years ago, and we're still fighting about it for some reason. But I think there's some great ideas at the heart of the agile movement, and I am happy to do what I can to shine a light on those ideas. Why not subscribe, click the bell icon, and give us a like. Matt, from your perspective and your experience, what's the purpose of a roadmap? I'm so glad you asked that question because the answer I will give you and your audience to the great chagrin of everybody over and over again is it depends. It depends. The purpose of a roadmap the question you just asked is the question that every team making roadmaps should ask first and one that they often don't pause to ask in the context of their own organization. I've seen teams have theoretical and academic conversations about what is a good or bad roadmap or what the right approach or wrong approach to roadmapping writ large is. And the truth is, I don't really care writ large. If you are creating a strategic communication document, you are presumably creating it because there is some purpose that it is supposed to serve. There is some audience it is for and some need that audience has. And that varies from organization to organization. If it didn't, then you wouldn't be saying there are sometimes I've had good roadmaps and sometimes I've had bad roadmaps. So I think that the question you're asking is really the first question any team approaching road mapping needs to ask and answer in their own context. And if they're not able to do that, then they probably have a bigger problem than what kind of roadmap should they build. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I think it's, again, one of the reasons why we don't have a an internet wide template for this thing going download your internet, you download your roadmap template here because for every company, it's different. Uh, well, we do have that we just have hundreds of <laughs> we have hundreds of competing templates each claiming in its own subtle way to solve a problem which cannot be solved at a global scale but only through contextual knowledge yeah such a great answer and it really makes us think actually about what what is the purpose of a roadmap or what do you want it to do what do you want it to do? Um, you know, do you want to paint it a picture of hope? Do you want it to align people together? Do you want it to, to be a conversation, uh, sorry, a document to have a conversation around? I love that. I love that answer, Matt. That's great. And so it can have quite a bit of scope there. So who do you feel is the audience of that roadmap then? So again, it depends. And that's one of the questions that is really important to answer. So when I work with teams on roadmaps, before we talk about the shape or format of the roadmap itself, the first thing we do is we sit down and write a document called the Roadmap Readme, which goes on a page. I say this is the one page that will follow the roadmap everywhere, that will go ahead of the roadmap. And we're just going to write down who is this for, what problem does it solve, how do we know if it's working, anything else you should know before you read it. And that's all we do before we think about, should it be an outcome or output based roadmap? How far should we just are trying to figure out who's it for? What's the problem it's trying to solve? How will we know if it's, if it's doing that? And once we have those answers, then we can get into some of those downstream questions and start thinking about the actual form and format of this artifact. But until you've had that conversation, because sometimes you also realize that you don't need one roadmap, you need five different roadmaps. You have, you know, for example, if you're working with a marketing team that needs to do a media buy by a certain date, they might need to know, all right, what are the stories we can tell about this product by this date? If you're working with an executive leadership team that needs to make resources to them, they might need to know, you know, something really different from another product team that needs to know what metrics you might be impacting or what parts of the product you might be creating dependencies around. I think in a lot of cases, when you try to solve the road mapping problem for a universal audience, 
it becomes a situation of diminishing returns where in order to meet the needs of one audience, you confound or frustrate another audience and you wind up with a document that makes nobody happy. So really figuring out what is the purpose of this? And if we have multiple audiences with multiple needs, let's actually separate this out and figure out what exactly each of those audiences needs and get that to them so that we don't think of it as the roadmap per se, but as a constellation of strategic communication documents, each of which is intended to serve a specific purpose for a specific audience. That deeply resonated with me. And actually, I think you beautifully answered a question so succinctly, actually, that we'll come on to you later that, Matt, if you can try and remember that one for later, that's going to be epic. I can never remember a thing I say after I say it. It's legitimately a problem for me. You mentioned the constellation of documents and that pulls in some of the story. You know, even you just describing that, um, you know, sort of fed a story into my mind. I was picturing what that looks like. And I think that's a big part of road mapping. And, and also one of the key takeaways that I think I took from there is that if you create a roadmap for everyone, you've created a roadmap for no one. It's just like, you know, if it tries to serve all of these purposes all in once, it doesn't actually help anybody. I think that's absolutely true. And you also wind up in the situation that I have seen many teams dealing with where they get so bogged down in trying to make the perfect roadmap that they spend a ton of time thinking about what roadmapping tool should we use, what's the right way to do a roadmap, and very little time actually solving the problem at hand or even understanding the problem at hand. It is so easy. It is a low stakes debate to talk about a roadmapping tool versus a different roadmapping tool or a roadmapping approach versus a different roadmapping approach. It's a debate that people can get very involved in and have strong opinions about without necessarily implicating their most important day-to-day -day work, which I think makes it a very appealing debate for teams that are afraid of having those deeper, more implicative conversations. Sometimes as a, a former product manager, you know, I've been working with the business and they can often go into a, a solution-based conversation, you know, where this is a solution before thinking about the problem space. And I think some, I've worked, uh, you know, I've worked for a very specific tool vendor for three years um, with, with AHA in the customer success team. So I was helping them with that. But what was very striking to me is that the tool isn't the silver bullet. And it's just there to help you to expedite or to share or, or, or to automate certain activities. But if you don't have good road mapping practices going in, then you're not going to have good road mapping practices going out. And some of these tools can be just very open. And sometimes you can hope that the tool brings a level of best practice in there, but sometimes they don't. Um, so I, I love that thought that you know, you really need to be intentional about what it is that you're trying to do with your roadmap. I, I tell people sometimes if you don't know how to ride a bicycle, you probably don't need a motorcycle that shoots lasers. And I stand by that because a lot of teams, especially teams that are new to road mapping, have some fundamental work to do to figure out how they want to communicate and what they are working on and why they are working on it. Um, there's a really, really great newsletter that Ken Norton puts out. Uh, and he has a post on his newsletter called The Tools Don't Matter, which I think about all the time. And in there, he offers some reframings away from questions like what roadmap and tool should we use and towards how do we communicate and decide these questions that are more based on the actual purpose that the tools are serving. And I think reframing that conversation to what are we trying to accomplish will rarely lead us to a conversation about feature sets of advanced tools. There is a time and a scale and a size and all those things where when there is a conversation to be had about the feature sets of advanced tools. But again, I think that tends to be a shiny object for teams that are struggling with more fundamental questions around how are we deciding what to work on, communicating what we are working on, why we are working on it. That's such a thoughtful and insightful answer. And I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I feel that tools are there to expedite processes. And it's, you know, it's very easy to go and buy a tool. And sometimes it's easier than to think about your processes. But those things up front makes, yeah, makes a massive difference. Let's think about then, um, who owns a roadmap and maybe who maintains that? Are they different people in your perspective? And, and what would you say from experience? Yeah, I mean, again, I'd say it all depends, but I think those are also questions that need to be figured out. How often is the roadmap revisited? One of the things I, I found during my foray into Agile world, one of the most mind-blowing things I learned was from a woman named Catherine Kuhn, who's an Agile 
consultant practitioner. And she told me basically the more frequent planning you do, the more adaptable you become, which I was definitely that scrappy young fellow going into corporate board and like, don't do planning. And they're like, yeah, we have to. And I'm like, do you though? And they did. But um, what she pointed out is that if you have more frequent planned cadences to adjust, you're more likely to actually adjust. It's not interruptive. It's not politically threatening. So I think this question of what is a predictable cadence for evaluating the roadmap, whatever it looks like, who evaluates it, how are decisions made, how often are those decisions made? Those are really important questions to ask and answer. And if you leave them to chance or if you leave the answers to those ambiguous, it is unlikely that much will happen with the roadmap. So I think having, again, counter to my nature as a fairly chaotic person, I am uh, a big believer in the power of frequent predictable cadences for decisions that need to be made around things like road mapping. Road mapping is a process, not, not necessarily just a single page artifact. And we need to slot into the natural rhythm of your, your own business. And, 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 you know, we need to encourage people to think about these things more, more frequently. Yeah, Matt, that's a, a really inspired answer. Thank you for that. One thing that you mentioned that I, I loved it actually was a constellation of artifacts. And I just, you know, it, it, I think it so beautifully kind of paints this with some storytelling in there as well. Um, what does that constellation look like for you in terms of the roadmap and, and what other things it interfaces with? So I'll tell you what I wind up doing with, with a lot of teams I work with. So first we will do this roadmap read me. And then the team will say, okay, great. We know what this needs to do. And I will say, great, let's prototype it on paper. Before we start looking up, what are all the different roadmap templates? Just get out a pen and paper. I'm putting five minutes on the cal on the timer, and you are going to go in there and prototype what you think an artifact would look like that captures this purpose. And it's great to see what people come up with because again, it's different in every context. Sometimes it looks like a Gantt chart. It does not always look like a Gantt chart. Sometimes it just looks like a list of like, here are our priorities for the next quarter just written out. Sometimes it looks like a visualization of the product with different things attached to it. There's a bunch of different ways to communicate whatever it is we are trying to communicate to whomever it is we are trying to communicate to, but that decide on the purpose and then prototype it um, is usually the approach I like to take to actually creating that constellation of artifacts because it also gets us into some thoughtful time boxing. If we only have 10 minutes to do a visualization, and sometimes I'll have everybody in the group. I've done a, a activity that I really love doing where it's almost like a bracket competition where it's like, Everybody comes up with a roadmap prototype. Then we put two against each other and pick our favorite. Then we pick two more against each other and pick our favorite. And each time you get one minute to incorporate the things you like from the one that did not win into the one that won. And by the end, you wind up with something which the whole team has contributed to in some way and feels pretty good about. And that winds up being a great starting point. And you can get through that whole exercise in an hour with a team. And you go from, okay, we know what this thing needs to accomplish to, okay, we've actually had a chance to work collaboratively in creating something that's going to be valuable for us. And that's going to be literally purpose built to what we are trying to accomplish as a team. Um, and then you got something and you try it and you retrospect on it. You see what's working, what's not working again in that remap, in that roadmap read me, we've said what it means for it to work and potentially what it means for it to not work. So we know what to test it against. And we can get on with our lives. We can stop obsessing over what is the best way to do road mapping and get back to building whatever it is we are seeing that we intend to build on our roadmap. Totally. I'm, I'm absolute gold there, Matt, as well. You know, I, I love that thought of, of bracketing, getting ideas of roadmaps from the very people. You know, not looking externally at what Spotify are doing or Dell or IBM are doing. It's like, what are we, you know, getting that knowledge from inside the company because they're going to know that rhythm of the business. They're going to know what roughly the stakeholders want to see. So coming up very quickly with that, and like you said, moving on with our lives, the roadmap is just one part of what we do, but getting to a quick answer as a starter for 10, I think our audience are going to find massive value in that. I hope so. I mean, I think, you know, when I started as a product manager, 
this idea that you own the roadmap, that that is a source of authority and credibility for you is something that was definitely imparted to me. But the roadmap is just a document. It's documentation. You know, you talk about agile and road mapping, right? If we're going to say working software over comprehensive documentation, which one is your roadmap? It's certainly not working software. So, you know, I sometimes think of the roadmap as like the final boss of documentation because it is the documentation that is going to be the most seductive to you. It's going to be the documentation that you will most want to own and control and see as a proxy for your value and your position in the organization. But for those very reasons, it's also, I think, one of the most important pieces of documentation for you to acknowledge as documentation and say, yeah, we're going to move through this as quickly as possible because our customers don't derive any value from our roadmap. They derive value from the things we are building. And if we spend too much time thinking about the roadmap and not enough time building things for our customers, then we are doing it wrong. So Matt, um, some great responses there. Let's talk a little bit about the, the design of a roadmap. So what do you typically believe are some of the key elements or content that, that you like to see on a roadmap? You know, I personally always like to see some representation of outcomes on a roadmap. I like to see why. Why are we doing this? What is it we actually hope to achieve? If I just see a roadmap in the traditional features on the Gantt chart with dates format, I don't care in most cases. I'm like, okay, sure, but why? What do we think this is going to achieve? And I know I am not alone in that. That is a widely held preference among um, folks who speak on podcasts such as this. But I think there is also a reality at play here that in most organizations, when you are asked for a roadmap, whoever's asking you for it is imagining that you are going to show up with a Yant chart. It's what folks are used to seeing. And it's in some cases what folks need to make specific resource allocation and other decisions. So, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the danger of our love of best practices in the product management world, because so many organizations for real legitimate reasons, to some extent, fall short of what people think the ideal is. And I often tell product managers, you can either fight against that and lose, or you can acknowledge that and do your best work within those constraints and in doing so start to reshape some of those constraints. So a lot of product managers have come to me, they want to get shot. I hate it. This company is terrible. We, we don't really do product the right way. And I'm like, okay, do they say you can't put outcomes on the Gantt chart? No. I'm like, okay, well then start with what you were asked for and start to move shift the window a little bit or say, great, like, hey, can we sit down and have a conversation before we do this, where we talk through the purpose? There is almost always a move to make road mapping a more useful tool for your particular purpose and to take those ideals of what a roadmap should be and begin applying them even when you have frustrating constraints and expectations to work within. And if there is one thing I want working product managers to take away from this conversation, it's Yes, you will probably have to make a Gantt chart at some point in your life. That doesn't mean that your company is only a feature factory and doesn't care about outcomes at all. It's an opportunity for you to figure out how to start from a place that is suboptimal and thoughtfully, deliberately start to create a better environment for your colleagues and your customers. Yeah, <clears throat> such a great answer. You know, we shouldn't assume. I think... You know, you mentioned about what it is that people are trying to see and that the CEO or the CPO, if they're new into the industry or they're new into the company, sorry, and they're just wanting to see, you know, what's going on. It's actually to have that conversation and say, well, look, what are you actually wanting to see with the roadmap? Are you just wanting to see that I'm promising 20 features in, in six months time? Or are you wanting to see that these are the problems and outcomes I'm delivering? And, and sometimes, you know, they get what they're given. But if you assume that that's what they wanted, that Gantt chart was what they wanted, then they'll see it and hold you to it. And so digging a bit deeper down, I mean, it, it, Matt, you must find this in, you know, in, in your space as well. When we talk about 
agile, people's understandings of it and people's interpretations of it are so massively different that you know somebody that might have had a bad experience with agile says agile's bad, similarly to someone that's had a bad experience with roadmap or vice versa. It's a single term or single word for such a massive concept that we can all have different takeaways from that. That's part of why I don't like talking about agile anymore because people you know, executives say, we want to do an agile transformation because they've heard that their team can get twice as much work done in half the time. Meanwhile, developers want to do an agile transformation because they heard it means they never have to commit to a deadline. Meanwhile, consultancies are selling an agile transformation because they're going to get paid a giant pile of cash to do things that don't actually mean anything. <laughs> so, you know, it, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I think what you said there is so important, Justin, that when someone asks you for a roadmap or a strategy or a vision or KPIs, ask them what they mean by that. Give them examples. Give them options. Um, I, you know, these are all terms that are ambiguous. And I think you're spot on that if you assume that when they say, oh, they must want this, then you're not only reinforcing that expectation, you're also not giving them an opportunity to learn. You're not giving them an opportunity to step into their best leadership position and say, I don't, oh, I don't know, what do you think is right? Or, oh, I've seen this before. Or if they're gonna say, I want a Gantt chart, give me a Gantt chart, then they'll say that. And at least you, it will be validated learning, not untested assumptions. Matt, such wisdom there. I can tell you've been through these conversations many, many times. I have, I have. And I have made all these, I mean, I have made all these mistakes so many times. When people ask me for a roadmap, I will still go off and be like, oh, they must mean this. And then I'll, I mean, I've been in a situation where somebody asks me for a roadmap. I assume or interpret that to mean that they want a Gantt chart full of features. I give them a Gantt chart full of features and they say, why are you bringing me a Gantt chart full of features? What is this, 1997? And I'm like, I know. <laughs> so yes, I think testing our own assumptions and uh, you know, finding that balance between acknowledging the constraints we're given, but also expanding and altering those constraints is so much of the challenge of doing this kind of work. And we were going to talk a little bit in, in terms of the, the design. We talked a bit about preferred ways to visualize or tools. And I think we've actually touched on that a lot, which is actually it's more important to think about what the audience is looking for and finding the right tool that underpins that at the right time. But I've seen some excellent roadmaps being done in Miro, and that's completely fine as well. I, part of why I like doing the roadmapping prototyping on paper is that you're not and a huge shout out to Christina Wadke, who is one of my favorite writers about everything, um, and whose book Pencil Me In, I highly recommend for folks like myself who do not fancy ourselves artists, but who need to learn the skills of visual communication. Um, you know, sometimes somebody will draw something which I never thought of as a roadmap, but, you know, I did this once with, with Trisha Wong, with my business partner. In, at Sutton Compass in New York, and we wound up drawing a, a ship on an ocean, going to, visiting different islands, and then uh, what the sea monsters were that were trying to devour the ship as it approached each island. And that wound up being our roadmap for a project because that told the story in a way that just made sense to us and helped us meet our purpose in that moment, which was how do we feel narratively engaged? How do we create stakes and meaning and you know, investment in this project. So I love using this unbounded, unbounded visual approach bound only by a time box because it gives us a chance to come up with new ways of visualizing things, which you certainly are not going to find in a, you know, Google Sheets roadmap, but template, but you are going to find uh, in your own imagination. What do you think some of the um, biggest mistakes people make are in road mapping? I think you may have alluded to some of those already, but um, just quickly fire through some of those. Yeah, I mean, I'd say number one thing is mistaking the roadmap for the product itself, right? The menu, my, one of my favorite quotes from Alan Watts, who said, uh, the menu is not the meal. And I think about that all the time when it comes to documentation. Your product roadmap is not your product. Your user story is not your user. These are, again, strategic communication documents but they are documents. And when you start focusing more on the roadmap or on the user story or on the presentation you're giving, the, 
it is bad and it is a trap I see a lot of teams falling into. And talking about you know some of those travesties, are there any anti-patterns or bad practices that you see teams falling into as well? Any additional ones there? Yeah, I mean, I think there's another one which has, has been a, a subtext and text running through this conversation, but I've seen teams get into a lot of relentless circular conversations about what is the quote unquote right way to do road mapping rather than taking pen to paper and doing something. Um, I see this a lot with product strategy as well. Part of why I like to get people from purpose to prototype as quickly as possible is that you actually learn a lot more when you're trying to prototype a living working document for your specific purpose, for your specific team, versus having a conversation about what do we think the right way is to do a thing, which again, is usually a pointless and fruitless conversation. So that's why, you know, a lot of coaching calls I have with product, I'm going to have to come up with my strategy for the next quarter. I'm like, great, let's prototype it right now in the next 10 minutes. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, prototype it and bring it to your team and see if it works. But until you try it, you won't know if it works. So don't disappear into a cave for a month and then come back with a hundred slide strategy deck. Throw something together, bring it to your team, see if it helps them make decisions and if they're the right decisions. And if not, then keep working on it. But it doesn't have to take forever. And do it quickly. Do it in a time-bound way. Like, you know, again, it is a means to an end. You are not delivering a roadmap to your customer. So don't just don't just don't matt you've you've shared some great people in our in our you know product roadmap our product and, and roadmap and, and agile fields there so whose advice on road mapping do you typically listen to um whoever is making the roadmap <laughs> that's the this is another area where i think you know as we've fallen in love more and more with best practices there is a tendency to take the word of thought leaders over the word of practitioners. And I struggle with that a lot because whoever is making a roadmap for their team is gonna know better what their team needs than I am. And I think, you know, the best thought leaders are people, you know, the people I really admire and respect, like the Teresa Torres's and Adam Thomas's and, and folks like that world are, are seeing close to practitioners, they're finding patterns and they're generalizing out those patterns and saying, here is a structure that is useful in a lot of different contexts for you to apply into your own context. Um, and I think that, yeah, just being able to recognize that whoever's making the roadmap is gonna know better what their team needs and what their organization needs. Those are the people to, to trust and listen to. And, and maybe if we're just bringing a concept to an idea from those people, well, we're going to be iterating on it so quickly to work with our stakeholders on what they want to see that we may move on from that anyway. So take that as a starting point, but don't get too caught up. Exactly. And again, part of the reason I like doing this generative paper thing is that sometimes somebody will come up with something that looks a lot like an existing thing, like that looks like an opportunity solution tree or something. And they're like, oh, well, you did. Like, I think that good ideas have a tendency to spontaneously regenerate themselves. Like when something is a good idea, multiple people will discover it independent of each other. So I also think it's fun when rather than starting with a thought leader styled idea and then customizing it, people start with a purpose built generative idea and then it starts to look more like something that you read about. And it's like, oh, that's really cool. Like that's that makes the person who came up with it feel validated and it also validates the the idea that they are inadvertently replicating such such great advice and i, I hope the listeners and, and the watchers at home are taking some things away from this because i think that's really important is don't don't get caught up on this enjoy that process uh, make it iterative, make it applicable to your industry. There's no other company out there like exactly like yours. So what should your roadmap or your processes be exactly like another company? If you had to distill your philosophy of roadmapping into a couple of sentences, what, what would you say? Start with purpose, prototype quickly, get on with it. Value bomb right there. Is there anything about road mapping that I should have asked you, but that I haven't? Anything that you kind of like to leave our audience with as a parting thought? It's such a big, important seeming topic, but 
again, my advice to people is trust your intuition, trust your local knowledge. You know what your team needs better than anyone else on earth does. Don't feel like there is some secret knowledge out there that only the most advanced roadmap experts have and that you have to do things the exact way they do things. You know better than anyone else what you need in your situation. Learn as much as you can, look at as many examples, absorb as much information as you can, but go with what seems right to you. A lot of what you said really resonates with with me there. I'm sure our audience would love to hear more from you as well. And, and I'm looking forward to kind of following you closely on, on LinkedIn and the more work that you do. As I mentioned, your books are, are on my reading, reading list. I've actually got Christina's book slightly higher at the moment because I bought that recently. So I'm going to be going through that one. But um, how can people tell us, tell the audience a little bit about what you do and, and how you can help them if they want to get in touch and work with you in future? So I am based in London right now. I am consulting and coaching, doing workshops, doing uh, longer term engagements with organizations that are trying to streamline the way that they work. As you may have guessed, I am a action oriented human being. I'm particularly interested in breaking the log jams of organizational complexity which can be issues for big companies and small companies alike. If you are stuck in the theory and you want help with practice, if you have big ambitious goals and you're not sure how to get there, then please reach out to me because I can help. Matt, I've, I've absolutely loved speaking with you today. What a refreshing perspective on something that people can get really caught up with, but actually we just need to disambiguate it and make it easy, right? Yeah, make it easy. It can be fun. Roadmap's going to be yeah. fun, I promise. Matt, thank you so much again. To the audience out there, if you've really enjoyed the discussion uh, between me and Matt, if something's resonated, please let us know in the comments or drop us a like. Or maybe share with this with somebody that you think could really learn from what Matt shared there already. Um, even though uh, Phil and myself are speaking with industry experts and practitioners, we always take these little nuggets away from these conversations. So if you find something of value, do share it on with somebody. And if you'd like to take place where, where Matt is, today and have a chat with myself or Phil um, in order to give us your views on road mapping. Do get in touch as well. But Matt, thanks again for being so gracious with your time. It's been a real pleasure. Cheers. This was a delight. Thanks so much, Justin.